Hello, I'm Bob Thompson, and welcome to the Victory Garden. We have a great show for you today, featuring Crathy's Castle in Scotland. It's one of the showcase gardens for the Scottish National Trust. And it seems that Peter Seabrook picked just the right time to visit. After that, Roger Swain is busy in the suburban vegetable garden, where one of his tasks is harvesting chicory for Marion's recipe. It's an exciting show, and it's just ahead, so please, stay tuned. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations, by the American Rental Association, 3,500 members nationwide renting tools and equipment for home gardening and construction needs, by W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's Professional Plant Food for all home gardening needs, indoors and out, and by Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide. Just a couple of weeks ago, my British colleague Peter Seabrook traveled up to northeastern Scotland to visit one of the premier gardens of the Scottish National Trust. Here's his report. Welcome to Scotland, and if you happen to be an expatriate, you'll think of all kinds of things. And at this time of the year, the salmon have been coming up the Dee and accumulating in little pools. And now they have to make what is called the obstacle. They have to make this jump to get another 15 miles up through those peaty waters to spawn. They've been swimming up, of course, for thousands, if not millions of years. And it's difficult to understand what drives them out in the ocean, building their energy. And then they have to come here to spawn. And it seems an impossible task, this 15 feet of rushing, surging water. And time and again, they throw themselves against those rocks and stones to make that obstacle. Oh, they just throw themselves. You'd think they'd be bruised and knocked. And time and again, they jump. Big fish, small fish, every size. They're getting very dark now as the season goes on. Earlier in the year, they'll be silver as they jump and fly. <gasps> oh. There's a fascination to it. You know, you can hardly tear yourself away, but we have a bit of gardening to do, so I'm afraid we must leave the fish. We have an institution in Great Britain called the National Trust, and there are two distinct bodies. There's the National Trust for England and Wales and the National Trust for Scotland. They have the responsibility to take uh, historic buildings and monuments into ownership and to maintain those in perpetuity for all of us to enjoy. And we are at one such today, Crathy Castle and Gardens, uh, operated by the Scottish National Trust. And for centuries, people have come on horseback and by carriage to this gate, which I am reassured was rebuilt in 1870. Here's a pretty impressive sort of entrance, guarded by these 300-year-old ewes. Why, oh, yes, what a setting for the entrance to the castle. Now, the guidebooks tell us that the same family have been living here for about 350-odd years, and I think you could begin to understand why the views across are quite magnificent, and all these really ancient old trimmed use, and down in that wall garden, eight little individual gardens, I'm told. But oh, oh, here's an idea, look, if we could only get right up the top there, we could really get a bird's eye view on what's going on. I presume this is the front door, looks a bit heavy. Is there anyone in there? Hear some feet somewhere. Something, something's creaking, look out. What's all the noise about? Oh, I'm Peter Seabrook from American Television. I wonder, could I come in a moment? Well, I'm afraid we don't usually use this entrance, but I suppose I can make an exception. I'm, I'm sorry to be barging in, but we've come to do a story on the gardens, and it looks to me as if we could get to the top of the tower. We could really set the scene and show everything. Is that well, possible? Yes, it would be a wonderful... It's, we don't normally do that, actually, and the place will be open to the public fairly soon, so we'd have to be quick. Well, we won't be a minute. Right. Uh, 
How many rooms are there in the castle? There are 14 in the Tower House. And which do you think is the most popular for the uh, well, tourists? Well, I think probably the Green Lady's room would be the most popular. That's a very pretty room, but how yes, does it get its name? Well, this is the room in which our green apparition appears. Apparition? Of course. Would a castle be a castle without a ghost? So what's the story then behind this? Well, they believe that she's the ghost of a young girl who lived here at the beginning of the 18th century. She became pregnant with an illegitimate baby. She was, as the guidebook puts it, cruelly used by a male retainer. Uh oh here we are in trouble again, yes. <laughs> Quite. And this is where she was kept during the term of her pregnancy. Probably where she died, very soon after the baby was born. For the baby itself, we don't really know what happened to it, but at the end of the last century, while some work was going on here, the, the workmen moved the hearthstone, and they found a little skeleton underneath it. Oh, that's sad. Yes, yeah. isn't it? And so have people seen this ghost recently? Yes, she's been seen. I haven't seen her personally, but uh, I'm always glad of company if I'm locking up after dark. Oh, I can imagine. It sort of feels mm. a bit cold. It's still, isn't it? I think we'll go up to that tower. <laughs> oh, but you get a view from up here. It's absolutely yes, spectacular, isn't it? Yes. But can you help me with my geography? First of all, I mean, where right. are we this way out to sea? Well, over to the east, you've got Aberdeen. Yeah. And then due south of here is Dundee and Perth. And then over to the west, further along the valley, is Braemar and Balmoral. And uh, Balmoral, that's where the Queen comes up from London yes, to spend the summer. Yes, she comes up at the end of the summer for her annual holiday. Yeah, but I can see why with these spectacular hills. And is that the Dee then running through there? Because that was full yes, of salmon fish. that's the Dee at the bottom of the yeah. field there. Oh, and the gardens, they're spectacular. We must have picked just about the best day with that lovely fall colour. Oh, the gardens are full of colour any time of the year. They there's all these lovely shades of green throughout the year. And then the first splash of colour comes from the border that leads down to the Duke out there, the June border. You get a lovely stripe of colour in among all the green. First, oh, beautiful. first of all in the season. A heavenly place to live, yeah. Yes, but too. the clouds look a bit heavy. I think we better get in those gardens before it rains. Probably a good idea. Yeah. There's so much to see here. We can only begin to give you a taste of it and everywhere there's these great yews giving protection and dominating the backdrop and now we're down into the wall garden we've got those great granite blocks all facing south building up that warmth in the summer so we can grow fairly tender plants the old globe artichoke that hasn't been grown for its fruiting heads they're not going to be dropped in boiling water that's there just for decoration it'll open like a big scots thistle and I'm surprised at the tremendous variety of plants. I mean, here, for example, here's the little tender fuchsia, lovely, delicate colour. You get a really tough, hard frost up in Scotland, it usually knocks that out. But in this protected garden, then they flower and grow as really I haven't seen them this far north. And then these lovely paths lined with azaleas, edged with box, those little colticums flowering. I mean, there's just so much to see, and everywhere you look, well, there's great views and there's detail. Sweet peas. Now, this has been a specialism for years. The old head gardener back here 20 years ago used to be raising and sheltering those, competing with uh, other estates, filling the air with fragrance on nice warm afternoons. And we got there mixed in the climbing rose, all the old lichens growing over that timber. And if you look through those squares, then you begin to see these garden rooms. We've got the tree peonies and the viburnums. This garden holds the country's collection of viburnums, lots of different varieties there. And there is, of course, replacement and renewal going on all the time. We talk about the National Trust caring for things. This is uh, made, this trellis, with wood from the estate here. It'll last about 20 or 25 years. And then with their own staff, they'll cut and replace that. Oh, and a lovely bit of history here. What we call the old saddle stone. It's like a mushroom. You put these down first and pieces of wood across them and then the ricks or stacks of corn are built on that and the rat that can come up here but it can't go round and underneath. So there's something really from history. Combine harvesters have destroyed all that I'm afraid. 
And there are some old timers here that uh, the hot summer has really done some damage to. And I rather gather there for the axe, they have to be replaced. Replaced, you have to note that, just as this trellis, as I was telling you, has been uh, nicely replaced. Yeah, oh. And now you can feel that sense of being in a new room. There's these lovely hebes, a New Zealand plant. That doesn't take a very tough winter. If you pet an exposed garden, that'll be cut back. But flowers beautifully in September. Doesn't matter when you come, there are things in flower. Then there's the blue spirea. That's a lovely plant for autumn. And look at the way they combine that with the lily of the Nile, the agapanthus. That's a variety called headborne hybrid. You need a fairly tough type to stand the cold conditions again in Scotland. But take your eyes away from these little plant collections and you have more sort of open views. Here's a lovely viewpoint where the paths cross of the bird bath, lovely old stone and seats back to those sweet peas. It is a heavenly place to be. Every day, colours changing. We've got the berries on the Catoniaster for the birds. Oh, and here's an interesting group. Look at this aged old cut-leaved maple, the Acer, Acer palmatum dissectum. And you have to be a little bit careful. If you have had some uh, branches damaged by drought, the leaves dropped, you need to just mark the stem with your thumbnail. You see how green that is? That's fine, that'll grow again next spring. Here, there's no life here, so that's dead and that really needs to be trimmed out. But as those leaves fall, look what they drop onto. A lovely double colchicum in groups, and the sedum. And then this coming right down to the ground, here's these lovely green leaves turning yellow and scarlet. And of course the lovely blue gentian. This is a speciality of North Scotland. That will open the brightest, richest blue. Acid soils and a bit of moisture. And then we've got the little groups of white colchicum, sometimes called naked ladies. Those flowers come up before the leaves. Oh yes. And you just have to keep taking in these wider views. Another one of those viburnums, which really has marvellous colour. And then we've got the Achillea. Good plant that for drying, although it's going on a bit past that. And this is one of the summer borders, full of colour in July and August. And a very good tip here, if you're growing the taller plants, this sort of pig netting, about six inches square, horizontal plants grow up through that and support themselves. Oh, but I do love these fall colours. There's the euonymus there. Those capsules, the pink capsules will break and show bright orange berries. And then the smoke bush. This is a lovely plant. This colour right through summer and any day now, it's going to go into flames and yellows and oranges, all those really rich, lovely shades. <laughs> now here's a touch of history. What about this then? I spoke about the horses coming up to the main gate and uh, this is the kind of trough they would have been drinking at for centuries. And there's a pretty good old tree here, one of the first planted about 1920, the Tibetan cherry. And you have to keep rubbing that, you know, if you have one of those in your garden and you go out each day and you rub that, then the bark really shines. But what about this lovely old range of glass houses? Now I understand the head gardener David might be in there. I'll just see if we can find him. David McLean, how long have you been working here then? Eight years now. Eight years as yes. head gardener. Now what used to happen in this marvellous range of houses then? I mean, they seem to have been built for specific purposes. Well, they were rebuilt 12 years ago. They were falling down and all the climbers were going over the top. And we had them completely rebuilt, designed as they were before, even with this lovely fine metal work. Marvellous, yeah. Very different now, of course. Um, this house actually is remaining the same. This is a propagating house. So everything was sort of rooted and, and started its life. Started its life. Yeah. And then as we climb up, what, what was in this house? This house was for the peaches of the two eaves, as you can see, growing up here and right over to the other side. Yeah, so there'd be some sort of back bending and trimming and training in here. A lot of hard work and, yeah. and looking after them. And of course they were grown for the castle, for feeding the family at the castle. So we had peaches and nectarines, and then what was in this house then? This is the vinery we're in now. As you can see again with the shape of it. And of course you can imagine a way back, lovely great bunches of grapes at this time of year. Yeah. But now what about pests and diseases though? Because there would be lots of uh, problems presumably. Oh yes, I'm, I'm sure there was, compared to these days, with so many modern insecticides. I've heard one or two stories. I've heard of them putting sulphur on the actual gratings 
so the heat from the pipes came up and set off the fumes from the sulphur. Yeah. This was to help to control the mildews. And the other thing I've heard from a, a story from a way back in the 1920s was that they used sheep droppings. They actually put sheep droppings on the pipes again. But that would be foul smelling and ammonia horrible, and stuff. Horrible. Yeah. And this was, this was actually supposed to um, give off this very, very strong smell to kill red spider, believe it or not. Well, then what would they do? When, I mean, when the sun come up, it would scorch, surely, wouldn't it? The gardeners early in the morning had to get up and open the vents before the sun started. No autom automatic vents in those days. Oh, and what about staffing? Would it be... Uh, you'd well... Have, you'd have less now? We have, at the present time, five in the yeah. garden full-time, and in those days there would be ten. And of course, no weed killers or pesticides. Everything was done by hand then. Yeah. Well, I was wondering about those hedges. I mean, the size of them. They're very different now. They used to take nine months to cut by hand shears. And the <laughs> next thing was they introduced in 25 years tarpon hedge cutters. And now they're all electric hedging shears. Six weeks to do it. Well, can we go and see that? Yes, let's go off and see them now. These hedges do give a sort of softness and quietness to these little garden enclosures, don't they? And shelter, of course. Yeah. But, but what, are, what are these sort of great cigar-y sort of things stuck on the corners for? These are actually put here for a purpose, a bit of thought behind it. As you come through from the archway of the hedge, you're hit by this blanket of hedge. But behind it, there's a big surprise, and you look behind there... Oh, I see. And what do you see? Another yeah. little section of the garden. So it's sort of surprise after surprise as you go yes, through right. these little... Well, they're like, it's, it's like a cathedral, really, isn't it? It's almost stepping back into history. Nearly 300 years, actually. 300 years as we walk through these... And what about uh, problems, other diseases or pests or anything? Our biggest problem is snow in the winter, forming on the top and knocking the hedges out of shape. So we have to come every day in the winter and pull the snow off. Mm -hmm. And we do get a, a lack of feeding problem with these big roots stretching 30 feet out into the lawn, into the path. And what happens is, we come along and we take off the top turf off there and we drill a hole and we put in some new soil and some slow-acting fertiliser and we put the turf back and this helps to encourage new growth on the they're, hedges. They're growing again then? Yes, oh yes, fresh growth. What's going on up here then? Here we're talking of modern hedge cutting. Oh, let's have a go at that. Well, I can quite see that say sometimes. The old boys in the past would love to have had that, I think. But who was the designer? You know, who was the master brain that had all this uh, sculpture almost in plants? Sir James Burnett, who used to live in the castle, was very much responsible for the trees and the shrubs in the garden and the estate. But his wife, Lady Burnett, was particularly responsible for the layout, as you can see here, the shape of the beds, and down the bottom half of the garden also. And her particular interest was the colour schemes of the garden. The blue garden, the dune border. Yeah. And was this her favourite then? This has a rather special feel to it. She was very fond of this garden, but definitely no, it wasn't her favourite. Her favourite garden was the colour garden you see above the top of the hedges. Now I am taken by the design tremendously here, because it's not only the sort of series of rooms, the eight gardens within a garden, but we have sort of gardens within a garden within a garden. garden. Everywhere you look, you sort of turn a corner and there's this another beautiful design system. Uh, but can you remind me again, what was the colour theme here? Three colours Lady Burnett used here. The reds, the purples and the yellows. I mean, that's a crazy mix. You wouldn't think of doing that, would you? Lady Burnett got away with it. And the, and the lovely backdrop of trees and vines, yeah. yeah. And then here, using those views again. It's almost like a sort of picture frame with the corners accentuated by those beautifully clipped views. Yeah. Well, now, I interrupted you in that uh, propagating. My apologies for that. But uh, thank you very much mm. for your time. I understand there's going to be a band playing by the steps. I must just take a little bit of that in, perhaps. And I'm going to spend several more hours in these gardens. They're marvellous. Thank you very much. Thank you. That visit did my Scottish soul good, Peter. There are some real garden gems in Scotland, and I'm glad that we can share some of them with our viewers. A little later in the season, we'll visit another trust property, Pitt Midden. Right now, though, let's join Roger Swain at the Suburban Garden. Welcome again to the Suburban Garden on a simply spectacular October afternoon. Now this border here is a very important border. We, strategically, it's where you get the first splash of color as you come into the yard. Ordinarily, we have a mixture of flashy annuals, but in the early spring, we like to have a display of bulbs. Now I've laid out some yellow Triumph tulips here. I like to space them out on top of the ground so I get some idea of where they're eventually going to go before I set them in. One clump here, 
one clump over here. And in between, I want to put a bed of Narcissus. It's a double daffodil called Tahiti, a yellow and orange, which I think will go very nicely with the yellow triumphs. The tulips are going to be annuals. I'm going to pull them out after they finish blooming. But the Narcissus naturalize so well that I'd like to put them in so that I'll have repeat bloom year after year. And that means devoting a little extra care to the hole, digging a, out a large area, and then putting a small handful of this bulb fertilizer. It's a special fertilizer with some organic matter in it, slow release. It contains both nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. I believe its analysis is 996. And just dig that in to the bottom of the hole, mixing it well. Remember, the roots are going to go down from the bulb, and that's where they're going to do their feeding. And then it's simply a matter of taking these daffodil bulbs and setting them in firmly, pressing them into the soil so you get good contact between the base of the bulb and the soil. And I'm going to make a ring of six of these tulip, oh, daffodil bulbs, rather, with one in the center. That's seven daffodils. And it's just a matter of filling in the hole, nothing to it, pouring the soil back in. It's always easier to dig your soil out and put it in a container, and then pour it back in. It's a lot neater. You're not trying to scrape it up off the lawn. Spread that out. And that's all there is. These will come on strong next spring and many years after. But let's go on into the vegetable garden now. Over here, we've got a couple crops that are really quite unusual in any New England garden. These are both really subtropical plants, and they do not like this cool weather. Look at our sweet potatoes, the first light frost, and boy, it's really hit them hard. Now, sweet potatoes are more a Jim Wilson crop than a Roger Swain crop, but we've had good success in the past with a raised bed jacketed in black plastic so it can catch the sun's heat. But sweet potatoes don't begin to make those thickened roots until just about the 1st of September when the day length has gotten short enough. And from then on, it's a race to see whether the potatoes will get big enough or whether frost will get here first. And let's see who's won this year. So just cut this plastic back a little bit and then reach for a spading fork. Get in well underneath the clump and lever it up and see. Oh, look at that. Look at that, Jim Wilson. Not too shabby, is it? Oh, it's even more fun than digging white potatoes. Now, the trick with sweet potatoes is they handle them very, very carefully because they, they bruise and then they don't keep well. Look at that. If you have too much fertilizer in the soil, you'll get long, thin roots. All a sweet potato is is really a, a thickened. Now, there's a rather inferior sweet potato, but nothing wrong with those. And that's a perfectly decent harvest from just a single plant. Now, I want to show you another tropical crop. This one's from Africa. It's called cane sorghum. I showed it to you earlier this summer. It looked just like a young corn plant, but look what it's done. That must be almost 10 feet high. What this plant is grown for is the sweet sap that's in the pith. The stalks are harvested like sugar cane, leaves pulled off. Commercially, they'd run it through a press that squeezed these stems flat, squeezed out the juice. But I'm just going to peel off the skin like that, exposing the soft pith. This is a real treat. Where do you get a taste of this? There, there's the, there's the pith. Mm. Just like eating candy. And you can cut these stalks and take them indoors, and the sugar will stay in the cane for months if you keep it downstairs where it's cool in the cellar. Come on, I've got something else I want to show you. My three boys simply love eating sorghum, but here's a crop that I've never been able to get them to eat. It's chicory, a bitter salad green. But in the cool weather, it's come on strong. There are no more than a dozen plants in this entire bed. Look at the size of that. Truly an adult tree. Let's see what Chef Marion can do with it. Chicory, also known as curly endive, or in the French, frise, is a robust lettuce that can accept strong flavored additions without losing its personality. Here I have half a pound of chicory, that makes about 10 cups, 
and I'm going to add some bacon bits, that's about half a pound, and a nice strong cheese, that's a gorgonzola. And I think some croutons, about a cup and a half of croutons. And now it needs a dressing. Over here, I'm heating up about a quarter of a cup of a good olive oil. And into that, I'm going to put some shallots, about two tablespoons, and just stir those around a little bit. And then in goes about a teaspoon of garlic, minced garlic. That's going to add a lovely, strong flavor. And then about a tablespoon, tablespoon and a half, of a very good red wine vinegar. And that just needs to get warmed up. And that's ready to drizzle over the salad. There. Mix that all up, and you're ready to serve. Chicory salad. About all this will need is a good grinding of black pepper. Well done, Marion. I hope you all enjoyed our program today, and please come back next time when we travel to the Hawaiian island of Kauai, home of the Pacific Tropical Botanical Garden. Until then, this is Bob Thompson from the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by public television stations, by the American Rental Association, 3,500 members nationwide renting tools and equipment for home gardening and construction needs, by W.R. Grace, makers of Peter's Professional Plant Food for all home gardening needs, indoors and out, and by Monrovia Nursery Company, major producer of container-grown plants, supplying garden centers and nurseries nationwide.